Thank you very much. Um, what I will talk now is uh, a little bit about uh, a work that I've been doing for more or less five years. And uh, uh, more recently, I face the, the need to have actually this kind of, oh, sorry, it's, uh, this is the point. To have uh, somehow 3D printing of physical replicas of this trabecular bone. I'll, I'll actually talk about this now. Um, sooner or later, every one of us will have the same problem, which is um, a problem that is actually growing with the life expectancy now. Uh, <clears throat> when you see the world map of life expectancy, for instance, well, I was just, uh, oh, again, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> We see that some countries, we have more than 75, 8 year old. Now we have someone that is already 8, 9, 90 year old. So uh, the life expectancy at birth, when the people actually were born. So some other countries has a little bit smaller and so on and so on. But when you see, it's much more than we had um, two, four, five centuries ago. And what is happening is, with the aging of the population, we had something here that uh, would show um, also a little bit about the life expectancy. But anyway, uh, I'll jump to this other one. When you see the problem is uh, the growth of the population and the aging of the population now. Okay, so if you, if you have a look, for instance, this is a case of uh, oh, the Europe, for instance. When you look at the population, you see that it actually is a bit old population and is getting older. So this is already 60, around 60 year old. And the, this mass is actually going to be older. Now in, in, in 10 years, we have a lot of old, old people. When you see, okay, here, if you count Europe, it's around uh, 732, um, million people, when you go there, just China is one billion, uh, one and a half billion, and if you see how is that, you know, so you have a, a huge population, old population, that's getting older and older, and when you look at the US, you see as well, that's a, a huge population, when you take Asia, so later on, you have in, in 19, here is 19, no, it's uh, 2020. So we have a huge mass of old people. And what's happening is uh, a disease that it didn't used to be present in the everyday life, that's called osteoporosis, you know, is now what we call, is now a, a disease that is coming with the aging of the population. It doesn't matter. It, 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 we say that this is a, is a disease <coughs> that uh, appears independent of other kind of disease you have. It always will come through, okay? So, <clears throat> and the, what's happened is the cost now is getting very, very high. And it's uh, actually, most of the country is starting treating this as a kind of public disease. And uh, uh, it's actually starting to take very much care because we have things like, uh, for instance, when you talk about <coughs> worldwide just fractures that we have, it's around 8.99 million fractures just doing to bone fragility. It's not a matter of I'm going driving and someone just knocked my car and I break my leg or I fall down and break my arm and so on. No, no, it's just doing to bone fragility that comes from osteoporosis. Uh, osteoporosis is actually uh, a disease that uh, take our bone and degrade our bone. Uh, so <clears throat> when you look at, for instance, uh, Europe, USA, and Japan, osteoporosis is estimated of around 20, uh, 75 million people now. Uh, and then you have see a, a lot of uh, information about what's happened you know, with osteoporosis now. If you see in terms of uh, cost of fragility fractures that has happened in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Sweden, and UK together, no? so just per year recently is around 31 billion euro. And that comes from public and from private. If you pay your own um, 
healthy company and so on, and the public with the people with uh, uh, problems of bone fragility and fractures. Uh, <clears throat> some estimations have shown that 2.05 million fractures occur in the US just a year, and <clears throat> with a cost of more or less 16 billion US dollars. So the governments and the private companies is actually get scared with this growth of osteoporosis all over the world, and not just osteoporosis, but the problem is the fractures. You know, the problem that we have with uh, uh, people with uh, bone fractures, and the, uh, of course one of them that is very important, and then someone here has problems, someone in the family, like mother or grandmother or parent or grandparents, on, that had already a problem with fractures in the family. Um, and they leak and they had to put prothesis and stay in the hospital for a couple of days, and out of that, as it provides a lot of morbidity, so it brings another kind of disease, and then you have pneumonia and some other thing, and sometimes, many times, the people die. Not just actually because of the fracture, but the fracture puts some morbidity, and then brought together some other disease, because you are already old, and so on and so on. So this is a really great, enormous problem now for, the, for most of the countries. And the <coughs> I decided to start a little bit of that, because I was doing something else in terms of uh, porous media. And then with porous media, I start looking to this problem and start talking with some medical or physicians and so on. And they find it nice. So um, I start looking at this in terms of modeling, more mathematical modeling. And the, what's, what is the problem now is the physicians know that we have osteoporosis by a very simple kind of measure, which is called BMD or, or densitometry. So they measure the density of the bone and say, okay, as you have 25% less bone than a normal person, so mm. you have osteoporosis. Okay? But then it starts happening that people with osteoporosis, already classified with osteoporosis, or some people that's called with osteopenia, which is not yet to 25% less bone, bone mass, you know, had fracture, very easy had a fracture. Then uh, <coughs> what, what's, what's actually needed then is to know what, what's the mechanical structure of the bone, how it responds when you have load to this bone. You know. So uh, I start looking at this problem then. Um, we have uh, several ways to start looking the problem of bone, but most recently the idea is to get image because we have uh, several good uh, new uh, imagery uh, methods. So the most recent ones, for instance, that is starting to get available in some kind of hospital is very costly, and the public service nowhere in the world use it to do just measurement of of uh, trabecular bone, for instance. But anyway, it, this is thing that's available most for the research. You know? So it's high resolution, parametric, quantitative, computer tomography. So it produces images, a set of slice, or set of image of, uh, of a bone. This is very important because it's the first time that we can have something with high resolution, and we, this, we say this in vivo. In vivo means with someone alive because we can use micro CT, but micro CT, micro, micro CT, which is microcomputer tomography, cannot be done in person, in, in vivo, because it has too much radiation, and so it's not allowed to do it, only in cadaver, in bone of cadavers. So, but then we lose a lot of information, real information from when you have a, someone in vivo. Uh, <coughs> Another method also used, which is, uh, he mentioned something like magnetic resonance imaging. So most of the hospital, they already have it, but they don't use very frequent these to look at bone fragility because it's still very high, very expensive, the cost. So it's not the primary uh, method to investigate bone fragility. It's not this one, <coughs> but now it's starting to get into business because uh, it has grown so much the demand of bone fragility. Uh, <clears throat> when you look at just one of the vertebra, for instance, so uh, using uh, computer tomography, we have uh, image 
from um, a vertebra, from the vertebra, we have a standard from, from the medical um, doctors, and then we get a region of interest, for instance, uh, and from this region, we normally have done the following, just use the, a method to binarize what is this bone here. Actually, the bone is, is, is a product of two things. One bone, which is the sternum, that everybody knows, which is hard, no? so it's called the cortical bone. But when you look inside, so it has this kind of thing here, which is called cancellous bone. The cancellous bone is formed by, we have these white things here, this network, which is called the trabecular bone. And then we have this other part here, which is in black, which is called the marrow, which means it's a kind of blood with fat and so on, that feed the cells to produce this trabecular bone, because this is a live, a live tissue, like uh, skin and so on. No? So <coughs> I start to have interest in that, and then we produce uh, image from both, from bones out of cadavers, and also some from other techniques like uh, uh, magnetic resonance image. And then we start looking at uh, image and uh, producing some kind of uh, bone reconstruction. When you look at this, just for the trabecular bone, this is uh, a, a, tra a trabecular network for a, a normal person. So in terms of the density, it's classified here as normal. And then we have someone that uh, already had a deterioration of your trabecular bone, so you can see the difference here. We lost a lot of things here. And then we have someone which is already osteoporotic. Actually, the three images are, are different uh, cadavers, and the, these ones are from the radius. Radius is here, which is easy to, to do it in, in some of the, the equipment. Okay, so, but then, uh, to look at this problem, and to look to fragility, to look to the mechanical competence, what are actually the really main parameters to be able to say how the bone is fragile, um, and then, because the idea is to get it to something that we call uh, a bone fracture, a kind of, uh, um, to prevent fracture, it's very important to know um, how the bone would respond to some kind of mechanical stimulus. Um, <clears throat> then I start looking at something which is essentially kind of densitometry. So this is very important. It's how much bone you have anyway. So this is called bone fraction, bone volume fraction. But when you look at something <coughs> else, it's very important connectivity, which means is how is your trabecular network is actually very high connected or already not so much connected, okay? Like here, we lost a lot of connectivity in here. Uh, <clears throat> but when we look to connect, co connectivity, it's not just connectivity, because it, I don't know, but by nature, what happens when you look at this, this is not like a building that we just construct with uh, uh, columns and the beams and so on, no? It's, 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 is very sinuous kind of uh, trabecular uh, network. And, uh, and then how this kind of thing uh, plays a role for the, for the strength of the bone. So I have to look something like tortuosity of the, the trabecular network. And of course, then we have to look at elasticity. You know, how elastic um, is uh, actually all the properties, you know, uh, elasticity props of the bone for that bone. Um, we have several other things that the medical docs look at when they want to somehow say uh, that one has a very high possibility of, of, of fragility and the fracture and so on. But this is still not very precise, not at all. Uh, but then they look at sex, they look, uh, look at uh, smoking, if you do gymnastic and this is on. Also now is very, very important is the following. A lot of people are taking medications and continuous medications that has corticoids. And the corticoids, even in any, anybody that takes a lot of medicine with corticoids will have a bone loss very quickly. And then this is a very dangerous thing in, in some sense. You have to take the medicine with very much care 
because then you, you get another problem, which is bone loss. Okay. Uh, <coughs> there are several ways to look at the metals uh, and, and so on, no, uh, but we are just going through the image base to get the information. Uh, It's not jumping? No. Oh, okay. All right. So the volume fractures is very easy with the image. You now from image we take the the, uh, <coughs> the measurement because it's actually uh, just looking at the volume here, the volume of bone that you have by the total uh, volume and then you have this kind of measurement then you know how much bone you have basically we are counting voxels and so on and this counting is not very difficult to, to, to be done so oh I point the other way I think okay Okay, when you look at the connectivity, connectivity is more, um, I would say, more mathematical thing here. So we, we actually uh, has to know a bit of differential geometry and so on to look at what is happening in between to this um, image. What is happening with the bone between the two image, set of image, and then we have a dissector. Someone has talked here about the Cavalieri, I think it was him, so it's called a dissecto, actually comes from stereology, this kind of thing to look at by image. But then we have a technique in mathematics which is a continuous, but then we just go to a discrete and from discrete we have the information out of the set of images. And by count is some, some tangent oh, um, there, oh it actually it's written in Portuguese over there. Uh, anyway, so we can count, we can have some information about uh, a connectivity of the network because that's very important. Um, we used to, to do the counting as he was mentioning. So when you look at one, one image and then you look at the, the following one, so when you just superpose those two, we have an idea of what's going on and counting the topology change inside. The, the, the kind of curvature and we count that. When you count that, then we can have a one quantity which provides some information about the, the, the connectivity of the structure, which is called the oily Poincaré characteristics. So this is done and we discretize and then we just put in a computer and you get a set of uh, uh, images and then we just can get this information uh, in terms of Olha point carré characteristic. Uh, then we need to know about tortuosity. So tortuosity is if you have a filament, if it's a straight line, but if you are, not, are no longer straight, so then you have a difference between what was a straight line or Euclidean thing, and then <coughs> what is uh, the geodesic length. So the difference between here, the, the, the ratio between the, the geodesic length and the Euclidean length provides the information of uh, uh, tortuosity, but there is, a, is actually is a porous media, and in the porous media we are looking at something that's called the grain, so, and it's a network, so how can we do that? So we develop also uh, an algorithm to compute for a network what is called the tortuosity of that uh, bulk, of that bone. Uh, so we managed to do that. When you see here we have a uh, one, one sample of trabecular bone, we see some of them here is a tube, like if you have, a, if you go straight, then if you look at this red thing here, it's just one, one part of a trabecula there, on the top of this slice, and then we see uh, how it propagates, uh, we call tubular, no, so a, a throat, uh, the brown one is just the network that goes down, and the green one is, it goes down, but at some stage, some another, other part of trabecular bone came from another piece. So uh, it's the one that's going up, but it's not originating from this one here. Now, if I just take just the, 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 the get rid of the green ones, so you can see this network here, just provided by this part. So then we have to calculate the total worst of this part. Uh, <coughs> so. Later, we had to do something in terms of elasticity. 
basically we start doing the very simple thing looking the elasticity in terms of uh, the isotropic bone which is um, not the reality actually but is close to the reality so we just did that because it was easier to do at the beginning and then it's very important to know when you have a kind of material what's the young modulus and then we just did the following these samples that I have actually came from a cadaver so we had this from a cadaver and then we just took the pictures okay this is something about uh, um, almost two centimeters that sample okay uh, and then if we just go to a mechanical engineering department and try to make the compression tests of that so we destroy our sample okay so to avoid destroying our sample we just do it using simulation but then it's a different matter okay because i i have you today nowadays we have in any mechanical engineering department they have very precise machines and so on to measure the the stress and the strain in every little piece of a body when it's under a compression test uh, <clears throat> so as we try to avoid to destroy this set of, of, of bones so we had to do it by simulation we did by simulation we have a, a reasonable idea of what's going on uh, <coughs> uh, here it doesn't, doesn't matter that much but anyway we just uh, get some information about uh, uh, the distribution of stress of load how the load is distributed over the bone when it is somehow a normal uh, osteopenic already near osteoporosis and so on but it doesn't really matter that much now what what what's the problem what's the point here is we did some simulation computer simulation using a system a software which is uh, actually uh, proprietary uh, and is very expensive which is called ANSYS uh, <coughs> but we did some some this calculation and out of that uh, what was important now what was important uh, I, I want to grade the fragility of the trabecular bone so um, we decided to use a technique to to fuse all the quantities connectivity trabecular bone <coughs> volume fraction uh, tortuosity and then elasticity in one single quantity so we we managed to do this using now what we call a, a mechanical competence parameter and uh, we normalize this mechanical competence parameter in such a way that when you have it uh, zero so um, it's, 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 a, it's a very good bone very solid and so on when it goes up to one so it is losing and it getting fragile so for that set of sample I can classify from zero to one anyway uh, 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 grading then um, the bone quality so as we had uh, 15 different samples okay so then we classified those samples according to what we had so we see from the ones that we have we have a oh sorry it was the way other way around so one is uh, the, the good one so then go 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 up to zero which is the worst that we had in our 16 sample but uh, uh, what happens we don't have actually uh, this was one one example of uh, uh, a vertebra that was uh, in vitro we say uh, and then we had this to do the test with the vertebra but then we destroyed that so we decided to not destroy the ones that we had here but it's not the same thing uh, to do actually the real essay on a mechanical uh, department with the people that knows exactly how to set and to measure all the quantities that are necessary uh, nowadays just uh, most recently a couple of years now three four years at most some people has start to use in 3d bone trabecular bone replicas um, um, but of course they are far from the real bone this is done but this is not done with uh, the material of the bone this is done with a kind of polymer just to see to have a look and so on i cannot do tests with that but of course i can do certain kind of tests in this one here because if uh, some people are using 
which is called quantitative uh, 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 ultrasound. Quantitative ultrasound is another technique to measure certain properties of trabecular bone. Some people are doing research on that. And then they just build this to use the, this technique with ultrasound. So it's not, not much problem because then you have the same sort of shape and so on, so it can provide some information you know, for qualitative ultrasound. But I cannot do any kind of mechanical compression test because this is not bone. You know? uh, it's not even similar to bone. Uh, so that is the place where we need now uh, 3D printing, is to produce something that's very similar to bone, that we can then uh, use it, use them, and uh, we can do scaling, not just two centimeters, perhaps a bigger one, that we can do compression, that we can counting, look at for the connectivity and counting that and, uh, and do the compression test to be able to have a more precise, accurate information to provide in that, in that uh, parameter, mechanical competence parameter. So this is an example of um, a dissertation of a guy from Stellenbosch University in South Africa, it was from last year, where uh, he has uh, used uh, the 3D printing out of some scanner uh, and then uh, this is a deformity that someone has here and it had to be operated and so on so the medical doctors then um, with him did a model that we can see here to start first and then look at how they can actually do the surgery and so on so this is a very nice piece of work of this fellow from South Africa um, and this is an actual example of a surgery that was last year uh, where they, the medicals did this thing here, which is, when you look at here, is a part of the pelvis. Someone had a problem. It, it was actually also a problem for collision and so on. And then to had to repair. So they first built this thing here, this part here and look at that and so on and so on. And the medical now is trying to, to do the surgery here and the, to do the corrections and so on. That's necessary to recover the, the, the patient. Okay. So this was done by 3D printing. You know? So this is in the laboratory, was done by 3D printing and they are actually using. And this is not the old, this is uh, almost two years ago now, by now. Okay. So it's like a real example. But uh, when, when my case is, is, well, it's not so, so, so hard. If, I, if you have something that we can go and can do this kind of uh, uh, test, not the compression test and so on, for me it would be very nice because I could provide better information. But uh, when you look at nowadays for the 3D tissue engineering, so this is a very, very, very important area and is fast growing and needs actually 3D printing. Because with the 3D printing here, uh, it's able to construct different kind of materials uh, that uh, has no, how we say, uh, the cells can actually grow in those matrices. Okay? And then uh, <coughs> we have some examples here how it was um, actually happened uh, for cell growth. And when you look at that, this is already a scale of, uh, as you can see here, nanometers. Okay? So, and it was actually done starting from some models made of uh, 3D printing. So it's an area that's actually growing very fast. Of course, the people are playing, and this is not mine, this is in this uh, web page here. And I, what, what's the future? But I would say that it's very important to have replicas now of this kind of bone, because we can play with them and do real stuff. But of course, I cannot do just by any polymer. I, I have to use <coughs> what is the bone made of. Okay, so um, with hydroxapatita and some kind of, uh, of uh, um, collagen and uh, other things that uh, you can <laughs> make it very close to the real stuff. So this area, matrix building of cell growth, it is very important now. Medical surgery support and teaching, of course, support is very, very important. Um, but people are already thinking about, you know, um, using it for actually uh, organs and 3D skin, eh? 3D printing, where we can actually repair 
when someone has a bone or, or a problem with a bone that you can do just do the scanning with the proper cell osteoblasting or cell class in certain place that it can grow very 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 fast so I would say that uh, I, I'm not a specialist I don't know much about 3d print that's my first time that I'm seeing actually one in my you know, uh, 3d printer I never saw it but I know that's important that uh, for me it would be very good if we had a, a 3d printer but not just to do the polymer or something it would be nice to see it but uh, to do real tests, it would be very important with the real material. And I know that it's already on the way now. Uh, people working with uh, specific kind of materials and powders that are very close to uh, the bone contents. You know? So thank you very much. Yeah.